It's been going on for more than a few years now. What we see in our entertainment trying to retcon, reimagine, deconstruct what it was like growing up as a kid in the 1980s. We are going to get into the rumors around the third Tron movie, especially involving Jared Leto in the title, which seems to be Tron Ares. But let's talk about where all of this stuff started with the original Tron movie. To do that, you have to understand the period of time in which it was made and why the movie was made by Disney in the first place. Now, I have to admit, it was one hell of a time to be growing up. The Cold War was in full swing. We had just gotten out of the stagflation nightmare of the 1970s. There was a sense of optimism. America was shedding its guilt and moving on from Watergate, from the Vietnam War. Ronald Reagan was freeing the economy of needless regulations and businesses were taking off. The dominant workplace generation were the baby boomers. Their children, Gen X, the generation which I am a part of, learned to be very independent and we are actually called the latchkey kid generation because at that time both parents were starting to work. It was a period of incredible creativity and innovation. Technology in Silicon Valley were just taking off, which actually plays a big part in the story of the little guy Flynn versus Encom in the original Tron movie. Culturally, America shifted into high gear. Stacks of new science fiction and fantasy series were being produced by brand new authors. The music industry had reached escape velocity from the nightmare that was disco. Cable TV was just coming in and there was a channel called MTV playing something no one had ever seen before, a music video. Hollywood was taking chances with fantasy and science fiction properties never seen before, thus creating franchises that we saw endless sequels to and are now seeing reimaginings for. I'm sure, like everyone else, I'm biased because that's what was out when I was a kid. But the 80s produced some of the most amazing, iconic franchises, in addition to music, when it comes to film and television that you will ever find. Not coincidentally, that is the same time when video games, as we know them, started to take off. If you were a kid growing up in the 80s, one thing that became a huge part of your life was going to the arcade. Now, you could go to your local Pizza Hut and they might have Ms. Pac-Man or Donkey Kong. But if you wanted to get a whole plethora of stand-up arcade games that you could play and literally spend all of your paper route money or allowance in a very short amount of time, you went to the arcade. As a matter of fact, the arcade was a social center. It was where you went to see people and to be seen. Factor into that that this was also the time when large malls were being built around the country with arcades being stuck in them. And that's where you were on a Friday night. The guys were trying to look tough in their jean jackets or members only wear. Or if you were like me, you looked like John Bender from The Breakfast Club. Because let's be honest, it's better to be infamous than popular, but I digress. There were roving gaggles of teenage girls. Collars were popped, swatches were worn, the hair was tall, the orange Juliuses were flowing, and whether you were into Quiet Riot, Duran Duran, Elvis Costello or Brian Adams, the hormones were pegged to 11. In all of this, you found your tribe. And I'm going to generalize here because in my experience, it actually was this way. The jocks ran with the jocks. The nerds congregated in the food court with their dice bags. You had the cheerleaders and the beauty queens and the hot girls. You had the artsy and theater types. 
You had the guys who loved to work on their muscle cars. You had the brainiacs. You had the proto stoner crowd. You had the skateboarding alterna kids. Not to mention the edgy juvenile delinquent crowd. In all of this, socioeconomic pecking order dynamic occurred around the arcade. And it wasn't just kids going in. There were adults all lined up to stand in front of their favorite game and plug quarters in. Everybody was trying to be top man, top score. Pac-Man changed everything when it came out in 1980. But it was 1981, in my opinion, where stand-up arcade video games really started taking off. 1981 was a year of remarkable innovation as well as prosperity for video game makers, launching new types of games that no one had ever seen before. I brought that up because you have to understand what it was that led to Disney making Tron in the first place, committing all of the money that they did in developing technologies that had not existed to that point. Tron was a movie made by Disney to ride and profit off the arcade mania wave. Alongside all of that, you had the ongoing phenomena that was Star Wars. The original Star Wars was of course released in 1977 and Empire Strikes Back came out in 1980. Walt Disney, along with every other studio out there, had been desperately trying to create something that could capture the box office receipts of George Lucas's Star Wars. Before Tron, Disney released a movie called The Black Hole. Critical reception at the time pointed out the obvious. This was a second-rate copy of Star Wars. At the time, it had a decent box office, but nowhere near what Disney hoped it would become. Now, one could arguably put the black hole in the same cult movie classic bucket as Tron. Both were a product of their time. Both were attempts to try and capture some of that Star Wars box office. And both were using, at the time, cutting-edge technology to make a science fiction film. But while The Black Hole lingers only has an obscure answer to a pub trivia question, Tron has endured. The year was 1982, and Disney desperately needed a big hit. Now, I was there in the theater in 1982 and watched Tron. There was a lot of hype. A lot of people were calling this the next Star Wars. And the one thing 12-year-old me remembers is I was bored for a lot of the film. Don't get me wrong. It was visually stunning. It had a great soundtrack, but it just went on and on and on. Despite the massive investment the studio put into Tron, it was only a minor financial and even worse, a minor critically received hit. Now, despite my perception of Tron, it undoubtedly has a huge cult following. As a matter of fact, I have a Tron poster on my wall because while I might not appreciate the story, I absolutely love the effects and how it captured the spirit of the 80s from that time in that movie. Tron had a brilliant hook, especially for the time that we talked about where arcades were so important in American culture. The concept of being sucked into the video game and actually having to fight within that game, who the hell wouldn't want to do that? The issue with Tron is not the awesome effects in high concept art, it's the story. And that's something that we've seen from Disney a lot, especially in the last decade in my opinion. Yet somehow, after 30 years, an underperforming, overpriced movie from the early 80s got a sequel in Tron Legacy. That 2010 reboot saw the return of both Jeff Bridges and Bruce Box Leitner reprising their roles as Kevin Flynn and Alan Bradley, and included Garrett Hedlund as 
Flynn's son, Sam, who responds to a message from his long lost father, Flynn, who has been stuck in the grid for years. Given the amount of time that had passed between <laughs> 1982 and 2010, it was very hard to reconcile what I was seeing, but I will say this, I think Tron Legacy was a very imperfect movie, but I do think from a story perspective, it was superior to the original Tron. There were some fantastic new characters that were introduced. The effects were off the chart and some of the battle scenes were absolutely amazing. The use of the de-aging technology, especially for Jeff Bridges, is creepy to me, I'm not gonna lie. But as far as entertainment value, I would definitely put Legacy ahead of the original Tron. Regardless of how you feel about Tron Legacy as a movie, one thing I think we all agree on is the Daft Punk soundtrack is an absolute masterpiece. When the final credits rolled on Legacy, we saw Sam Flynn's son on a motorcycle with Quora played by Olivia Wilde. His father Flynn was still in the grid and we presume had perished, but this being Disney, I'm sure he's gonna have survived somehow. Which brings us to the Jared Leto tweet from last September. There are many signs that in fact, a third installment of Tron are going to be underway. While it was originally reported this was going to be back on the big screen, it looks unfortunately like it's going where intellectual properties go to die, Disney Plus. From everything we are seeing, Garrett Hedlund will be back as Sam Flynn. Bruce Boxleitner will be back as Alan Bradley. Olivia Wilde back as Cora. And we don't know exactly what Gerald Leto is going to be. Although I would say at this point, he is going to be an antagonist, probably the principal bad guy in this small screen realization of Tron. You know, I think there's a million different ways you could go with a third installment of Tron. And I bet there are a whole lot of hardcore original Tron movie fans that could give Disney much better ideas than I guarantee we're going to get. Now that we've talked about the origin of the original Tron, taking a look at Legacy, and now seeing where Disney Plus has gone with, my God, virtually everything they have, whether it's Star Wars, Marvel, what do you think they're going to do with this Tron streaming show? Did you like the original Tron movie? What did you think about Tron Legacies? Are you interested in what Disney Plus is gonna be doing on the small screen with this Tron Ares title? Tell me in the comments below, as ever, this is Salty Texas C. I am Corey DB. Thanks for watching. Please hit that thumbs up button. I hope you have an awesome week.